Welcome to the Geo Economics Podcast. I'm your host, Alexa Pomazovich, and today I'm talking to Mina Shah. Mina works in a very interesting industry. She's active with Navis, a firm that creates digital solutions for ports and container shipping. Um, that might sound quite dry, but we feel like an understanding of how much complexity there is in ensuring the running of supply chains will really hammer home how uh, how exciting the industry of SEZs can be. Uh, we don't go too deep into jargon or anything like that, uh, so it's a really potable and enjoyable conversation. Uh, without further ado, here's Mina. And here I am with Mina. Mina, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you, Alaska. How are you? Doing excellent. Thanks for coming on to the podcast. So you, yourself as somebody who's active in the uh, in the shipping industry is something that's really interesting to me because uh, when I was younger, I'd read this book called uh, The Box. And what it talks about is how the shipping container was invented and how it became commonplace and uh, implemented in the, uh, in the international shipping industry. So I was wondering if you could walk us through sort of what the history of shipping looked like. You know, back in the 1700s, I assume you'd get a bunch of uh, barrels and uh, boxes and just irregular types. Type cargo getting loaded into a ship from uh, from the most unusual angles, and it was a just really annoying thing to do. So, w- what did the shipping world look like before containers? Yeah, so so we've been, you know, uh, as a species, humans uh, involved in cargo shipping for thousands of years. Uh, so, commercial shipping began actually with the Phoenicians. Um, they used to operate their own vessels, and they were transporting goods all around the Mediterranean. Those were then adopted by Greece, by Rome, and then into the Middle Ages and modern times. Um, um, and up into the Venetians, 1300s to 1500s, they had huge fleets. The Dutch, of course, we get into then kind of imperialism, colonialism. And for most of this time, shipping actually remained pretty much the same. Uh, they were loading and unloading. It was quite slow. Ships might remain in port for days or even weeks. Um, so you probably even remember this from like classic films like uh, on the waterfront where you have kind of uh, Marlon Brando as the New York dock worker, Terry Malloy, and he's climbing into like the rusting hulls of cargo ships and actually taking out the freight, either using nets, grappling hooks. You know, that was how things were done for kind of thousands of years, pretty much unchanged. Um, So they're moving things like uh, farming equipment, train cars, boats, all of this kind of odd sized stuff. And then of course we have containerization. So you know, Malcolm McLean, as it's mentioned in the box, it's all about that. In the early 60s, you know, there's this dramatic change where they start to standardize. And so they come up with this concept called a shipping container. And now a container ship that used to be unloaded by 40 to 60 men in three to five days, that same amount of goods could now, um, or sorry, that same amount of, of goods that was unloaded once you had containerization with 40 to 60 men in three to five days, that used to take pre-containerization 200 to 400 men and a about eight to 10 days. So it was a huge improvement in productivity and just the time and quickness to handle these vessels. And so with that kind of came two main standards of containers, um, you know, the 20 foot container and the 40 foot container. And so of course, in the world of shipping, you'll often hear people talk about TU, so that's 20 20 foot equivalent units. And that's typically how we talk about the volumes that are handled. And I mean, just for numbers sake, uh, what is the... Uh, what is the largest port in the world as far as uh, TEU throughput? Oh, yeah. I think the the top 10, I think eight of the top 10 largest ports in the world are all in China. I haven't seen the, the latest figures, but of course, with COVID, China really uh, bounced back in the later half of 2020. Um, so typically, Port of Shanghai is up there, Port of Ningbo. I actually don't have these uh, <laughs> numbers offhand in front of me. So I'm thinking about, uh, you know, Shanghai. Being, uh, being one of the largest ports in the world. And funnily enough, it's also a special economic zone, which we can get into. I'm thinking about how, you know, something gets produced in, uh, in a special economic zone in China, for example, and then the journey that that product takes. So uh, when I was a kid, uh, I was quite into, uh, into action figures and, uh, you know, they, they would say that they're, uh, that they're made in China. So let's take, for example, like an action man action figure uh, getting made in, uh, in a special economic zone, in, let's say Shanghai. And, uh, you know, hundreds of boxes of them uh, make up one shipping container, one uh, 20 foot, uh, one 20 foot shipping container. So let's start looking at the journey of that container and just see like, what is all the stuff that takes uh, that it takes uh, for uh, for this produced product to uh, to make it to uh, you know somebody in uh, in Serbia who's playing with this the the loading system for uh, for shipping containers is it loaded by hand Do, uh, are there uh, pallets with uh, with forklifts so how does the loading of a container work sure so I think um, 
one thing to talk about might be all the different entities. So in this process, if we're starting with, say, a shipper, so they've got a good something in China, a toy that they want to sell. So the first thing that happens is that shipper is going to make an agreement with a consignee. So they're going to make an agreement with someone that they're going to actually be financially responsible for buying that cargo. They're going to receive that shipment. So there's a business agreement between that producer who's shipping it and that consignee who wants to purchase and receive that good. So they make this agreement. Okay, great. <laughs> that shipper is now going to get paid to transport this and sort sort out the arrival of that. So now that this cargo has a destination, the shipper will then go and make what's called an export booking. So they need to export this to another country, for instance. So they'll need to specify kind of what it is, where is it coming from, and where is it going? And that's kind of representing that business relationship with buyer. The shipper will now contact a trucking company. They're going to pick up an empty container. That empty container will then arrive to the shipper. So say it's this factory in China, and they've got a warehouse. They'll bring this empty container to that warehouse, and they'll start filling it maybe with all these toys and already in packaged pallets. That container will get sealed up. It's now a full export container. It will be brought to the container terminal. The container terminal, of course, have those papers. Where's that destination going? And that will be planned onto a ship and stored into the yard. So it'll wait the kind of loading onto the right vessel that it's been planned into. When that vessel arrives into the port, the terminal will then, of course, plan the loading activity from the storage area onto that vessel. And then the vessel will sail. Now, this vessel might have several different stops. At this point, the booking now becomes called a bill of lading. And the manifest... It's just going to be all the bills of lading for all those export items and that stove plan, all those containers on that vessel, they're sent to those other terminals that are downstream. And so this vessel will now arrive at, let's say, the, the destination um, port. So say you're ordering this toy from China, you're now in the U.S., this is now coming into L.A. So that terminal in L.A. will kind of receive the complete manifest, all those bills of lading for that vessel and the plan where those vessels are on that container ship. And those full imports now will be planned into the yard for that terminal and that vessel will proceed to be discharged. So they'll start unloading that cargo. And as far as unloading goes, I mean, I'm thinking about this in a very uh, complicated way and you can say more about this. Like when you're loading a massive container ship, and I mean, I, I don't even know how many containers most uh, most ships carry, but I assume it's a lot. These different containers have different weights in them. You know, some of them are carrying cars, some of them are carrying extremely light things like, uh, you know, clothing or whatever. And uh, I'm just thinking about... I'm just thinking about what the order is that these containers need to be loaded in so as to make sure that the ship doesn't capsize. Um, so I'm thinking about like, are there uh, AI systems or uh, are, there very, are there various like ways to figure out uh, in which order these uh, these containers get loaded into the ship? Uh, definitely. So, so if we take maybe like the average container ship size, something like 8,000 TU. So there's 8,000 potential spots to place a container. Um, if you were to do that as, as a factory every possible combination, you know, you're going to end up with this number. Um, I think it's like, you know, 28,000 digits long, you know, it's a huge number of possible combinations. Now that's if everything's equal. And back in the 1980s, this is how people did it. They did it kind of manually. They planned this out with sticky notes on paper and really relying on the experience of people who've been doing this job for, for 10 or 15 years to kind of quickly do this it was still really cumbersome. So in the 1980s, we see kind of the rise of technology in the space, um, solutions to automate this whole process. And so you have solutions like this for the shipping lines to determine how those load plans will look. Of course, they're concerned about this cargo as it moves from port to port to port along different terminals and how to really minimize um, restacking containers, not handling ones for a later port that are covering an earlier port, for instance. But they're also concerned about that vessel being seaworthy. And so you'll see instances where containers have maybe capsized. You know, we see it in the news. It's kind of a big environmental disaster, um, you know, something that, of course, everybody wants to avoid. Um, but these are really the result of things like um, weight inversions. Uh, you know, if you're, you're too heavy weights on the um, bow and the stern, the front and the back of the ship, you can actually snap the whole ship in half. And of course, these ships are, are massively expensive. So, so that's huge. Not just the cargo loss, um, the potential loss of life, the environmental damage, but the ship itself as an asset can also get sunk in such a process. So really 
computerizing this, taking it out of the hands of, um, let's say, humans to make those decisions, but really automating those and using like physical rules of the structure and, and the physics models involved uh, really helps this process to provide that safety, but also accelerates that. So something where you might have spent three days kind of planning all of this, you can now do in, in um, minutes or hours across the schedule. So, um, so yes, most of the major shipping lines, I mean, almost everybody at this point, they have computerized solutions to do this. So they'll typically have a team that's um, approving and modifying these plans and planning out this cargo. Now, one of the things with shipping is we we live in a world of just-in-time shipping, you know, and that's part of what's made the industry able to be um, so lean, um, to be so responsive, is inventory is not really kept in lots of places. Now that's starting to change a little bit because of the COVID pandemic and the resiliency that needed to get built into the supply chain to handle that. But just-in-time shipping had a lot of these changes that would happen. You know, you, you might be planning out this vessel, but you're planning for containers that haven't arrived yet at your port or at your terminal and you know, say there's traffic or a delay at a warehouse, you know, it could actually miss the cutoff for that vessel. So there had to be this amount of flexibility and agility also built into that plan that, you know, was really hard to accommodate when everything was being done manually. Of course, if you're running it on a computer, you're able to kind of just create a new plan in 20 minutes or constantly update that as your containers are coming in because you've not yet confirmed them and, and you're kind of swapping them around in real time, um, that can really help you kind of follow some of these rules. So we mentioned weights, you know, I use the example of, of weights at the front of the back of the ship, because typically you always want to keep your weight low and centered to be stable, to be seaworthy, but you also have issues with what we call weight inversions. So if you have a very heavy container, for instance, on top of an empty container, it can actually crush it. Uh, so, you know, now you're dealing with kind of damaged assets and damages. So you don't want to do that. And so typically, even as you're doing that just in time, time swapping and planning, you want to make sure you're swapping things that maybe make sense to swap around. So perhaps they're similar weights. Um, you probably also want to ensure that the port of discharges are the same to avoid extra cost handling or unburying containers at a future port. So you can see that the terminal, as it's operating um, the loading and unloading of this vessel, it's going to be changing this plan in real time. But you also have uh, the shipping line that it's their asset. And so they're going to want to have some oversight. They're going to want to have approval of that plan. They're going to want to ensure that that plan's seaworthy, that it's safe. And they're going to want to run it through their own calculations. So typically, these ships have what's called a loading computer. This is like an onboard computer that is running the kind of physics models of these plans. And so whenever the terminal is kind of adjusting or publishing this plan, having this communication so they can get approval from the ship's captain that that's a seaworthy approved plan, that there's not going to later be a damages claim that can kind of get blamed on one party uh, as a part of anything unforeseen that might happen. This, this is fascinating stuff. Uh, another thing that you mentioned uh, that I'd like to just uh, hop back on real quick is the fact that when the ship leaves port and goes to the next one, uh, there may be a port of call that it visits uh, on the way over to the final destination, and they may have to unload certain containers into that port and load up different ones. So the model also needs to account for where in the ship does a container need to be placed, not just for weight, but also at which point that container needs to be unloaded. So there's just several layers of complexity that go into how a ship gets loaded uh, with containers. Um, what I'm thinking about, what I'm thinking about right now, as far as uh, as far as this complexity goes, is that this entire supply chain is so complicated and so fragile that if one thing goes wrong, uh, there's a massive cascade of uh, negative consequences that go afterwards. So can you give us an example of what happens when things go wrong in the, uh, not just the loading of a ship, but also in at, at any other stage in the shipping process? Sure. So, so I think claims management often is um, generally where these things go. If some bad incident kind of happens, uh, insurance gets involved, lawyers get involved. Um, and so typically, you know, every kind of stakeholder will have these different records, audit trails that they're keeping. Um, because they're going to want to kind of say, hey, you know, when this left, either it's my facility, when this left my hands, you know, everything was good. The situation was good. We passed all the required safety checks. Now, sometimes these are government regulations. Sometimes they're IMO regulations that they need to follow. Uh, and of course, different organizations, big shipping lines, they have their own internal practices to, of course, mitigate these kinds of risks and claims that can be called. And so typically all of these various stakeholders keep 
meticulous records. Now, that means lots and lots of paper trails for some of them where they're not fully digitized, um, but lots of paper trails, which they will actually go back to if there is a claims made. They'll have to get their accountants involved and go back through and look at that audit trail to kind of really prove, you know, no, I'm not actually liable for this. This is a different party that was liable. And that can become quite contentious indeed. So cases in you know, lost uh, lost cargo or uh, accidents or stuff like that. Who handles that? Is it uh, because most of this stuff happens in like international waters, right? So is there a flag state that uh, that handles issues of this type or uh, what organizations and uh, institutions handle this stuff? Yeah, typically the terminals, the shipping lines, the carriers, they all have agreements with each other. And so they'll have uh, actual use agreements, service level agreements. And in those contracts and agreements, they will stipulate how they'll go about uh, resolving a dispute. Um, That might also stipulate kind of where the jurisdiction is, how it will go arbitrated or mediated. And of course, uh, they all have their own insurance companies that might then come into play here and, uh, you know, start laying an insurance and the lawyers start sorting things out. I mean, with all that stuff going on in the shipping industry, they must operate on razor thin margins, don't they? Yeah, it's been interesting with the kind of COVID pandemic and and sort of the, the fallen um, the fallen volumes that we saw at the beginning of 2020 and then the, the huge bounce back. And a lot of that bounce back, we were able to see that uh, a lot of different players were able to control costs. Um, so shipping lines just started reducing their routes. They started, um, you know, we call it blank sailing. They started skipping certain ports. And this was all in an effect to drive costs down um, and really kind of prevent what was becoming an overcapacity and a, and a kind of glut in the supply chain. Um, so I think we don't always think about the amount of resiliency and slack that's built in because we're we're kind of coming from this just-in-time shipping world, and it seems like you know you miss something. There's such small margins and such small errors, but I think 2020 actually showed us there's quite a bit of resiliency built in. And I don't think we were all necessarily aware of that until we were forced into a situation to observe it in real life. So even though it's uh, it's a somewhat, uh, I, I wouldn't say, uh, I wouldn't say legacy industry, containerization has only been around for, uh, for like 70 or 80 years. But uh, even uh, even with the level of, uh, of, inf- uh, of infrastructure that's necessary for something like this, there is still a level of resiliency built into, uh, built, built into the industry, which, uh, which I think is really impressive. Um, what, what would you say are the major uh, trends in the shipping industry that you see over the next 20 or 30 years? Is it independently operating ships like uh, drone type uh, vessels? Or uh, is there going to be a revolution in how how port uh, port operations function uh, independently and auto- in, in, in an automated fashion? Uh, what direction is shipping going as far as uh, automation goes? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So um, certainly we've seen a, a kind of pickup um, in automation. Of course, that's, that's where I started in my career in this whole industry was building software solutions for automated terminals and ports. And when we look at terminal automation, that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. It could mean processes getting automated and and digitized and simplified. Um, Typically, um, when we're talking about it, we're talking about the robotization of equipment. So really removing people um, from the operation. And of course, container shipping is still um, one of the most shipping in general, not just container shipping. It is one of the most dangerous industries in the world. Uh, still, you know, it's you're dealing with a very heavy equipment, um, and, and it can be very challenging. Low visibility and and people walking around, and obviously, you know, there's often accidents, and, and they're always a tragedy. And I would say where we are with um, terminal automation and the container terminal space, you know, I think we've kind of crossed the the chasm of let's say the early adopters, and now kind of into the early majority. And so we see a lot of terminals now adopting brownfield automation into their operations. Um, certainly, we see less greenfield projects in general um, being invested in. And I think as we look at the next five years, container throughput is forecasted to grow about five percent, and we're seeing with 2020, the acceleration of a lot of investment in digitalization and automation and solutions. Now, part of that was during the early part of 2020, a lot of investments went on hold. There was so much uncertainty. Everybody was trying to cut costs. Um, But then as we got into kind of later 2020, 2021, you know, the financial markets were extremely liquid. And so we saw kind of a huge acceleration of one that kind of pent up demand of investment, um, but also just kind of looking to take advantage of that abundant liquidity. 
Um, so we saw consolidation um, that brings a level of security also um, in terms of just having more ports, more assets that they can diversify between, um, but also investment in other kinds of technology. Um, so I think even within our customer base, um, and the terminals and ports that we work with, we saw some really interesting uses of technology. I think one example uh, I thought was really interesting was the Port of Montreal. And they actually deployed out um, like a, you know, a neat little AI solution that they could um, see all the manifests and actually accelerate handling of PPE equipment. So try to kind of avoid a two-day delay on unloading PPE and accelerate that um, for their local Montreal community. Um, and so I think we saw lots of those kind of medical equipment, um, pharmaceuticals kind of getting accelerated with things like um, machine learning and those kind of optimizations that, you know, I think without something like COVID, you know, could have easily taken five more years to be adopted. So what's something that you're uh, that you're specifically looking forward to in your own industry? Uh, from what I understand, uh, your company, Navis, uh, works in the uh, in the automation space and uh, sort of the software angle of, uh, of ports. Uh, are you guys looking forward to uh, uh, any particular revolution? I'm thinking things like uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, maybe even uh, distributed systems like blockchain, etc. Are, are any of these uh, technologies poised to create an, uh, uh, create an advent in in the uh, software angle of, uh, of ports. Definitely. Uh, and I think, I think AI and machine learning probably has the greatest potential, um, you know, not just looking at uh, terminals and ports, but also shipping lines. They're all sitting on so much data, um, so much data. You know, one of my, one of my customers joked with me of like, if we could actually really analyze this data, right. You know, I'd be making bets on the stock market, you know, some of this, cause you're really looking at where is growth going to be in the future and you're getting some great insights um, into some of this kind of data. Um, but typically, you know, it's it's all unstructured data. And, and for anyone that's worked in um, AI or in machine learning, it's not necessarily the models and the insight that's the, the most difficult. It's actually understanding the business value that you want to drive. And then how do you take all this unstructured data and all these different data sources and, and get that into something that's useful? And and I think we have kind of a main challenge in logistics generally, which is everyone sitting on these kind of piles of data. It's incomplete. It's maybe inaccurate. And it's not really shared uh, across. And, and there's different reasons for that lack of sharing. And so while I think AI and machine learning can you know, possibly be the most important technology that gets adopted, it does rely on, you know, driving this data-driven uh, ecosystem. And that relies on collaborating and sharing this data and having kind of what is really that that single source of data. And, and that's a term that it gets, I think, misused a lot. A lot of people kind of say, you know, blockchain is the solution to that. Um, and, you know, I, I, I live in technology and I, I always love like fancy buzzwords. I think they're great, but I think any technology, it's only ever as good as, you know, the ability to bring real value and to drive adoption. And so one of the things we saw over the last five years, like blockchain became um, quite a big hype. There were lots of different blockchain platforms. And I think now we're seeing many players um, start to consolidate perhaps on the, the Merce Trade Lines platform. I think you you're going to end up needing something like a platform to really drive these kind of network effects to get the return um, that you would really get from this kind of investment. Because of course, adopting any of these technologies, you are changing existing business processes. You're often changing legacy systems. You're changing the way people work. Uh, and all of that has a huge change management cost. One of the things we see when we're working with our clients is it's often not the cost of the technology itself, but it's that change management costs and, and driving that through an organization that's often the most challenging when you're trying to drive change. And, you know, we often think of the shipping industry as being kind of technology laggards. Um, you know, I think, I think we all say that. <laughs> so um, I think it's kind of well accepted. And I, I think it comes more from this, um, this change management kind of cost of really embracing, embracing that change, doing things differently. And so that can be so hard to to change and, and drive in an organization. Absolutely, and particularly in a you know complex and inter interdependent system as much as uh, as much as shipping is, because fundamentally everybody needs to be running the same system in order for it to make sense. And the way that I'm thinking about change being implemented in a complex system like shipping, I think special economic zones or similar uh, local experiments in new models uh, should be the way to go about it. And you can uh, you can correct me if you think this might not be correct, but uh, I'm thinking about 
if we're uh, if we're looking at a new way of loading ships or a new type of you know whatever comes after the sh- the twenty foot foot the forty foot shipping container, the way that something like that ought to be experimented with is in a local uh, local environment. I'm thinking you know a small port that is still trying uh, that is still working on uh, on pre AI pre ML uh, operating systems for uh, for their port for their uh, port operations and allowing them to experiment with this completely new uh, non non economy of scale system to see how much of a percentage wise uh, percentage wise increase they uh, they gain in uh, in productivity and then uh, using that as a case study it might be possible to expand that model to elsewhere so uh, do do you think that having these experimental ports as petri dishes for uh, for these new logistical innovations make sense or uh, should we just start from the large ones and then the smaller ones will uh, will adopt it is it a bottom bottom down Sorry, a bottom-up scenario or top-down? Yeah, that, that's a great question. You know, you have these big ports like Port of Rotterdam, Port of Antwerp, uh, you know, Hamburg. They're super advanced. You know, they're always looking at all of these new technologies. They're always experimenting and innovating. But I think one of the challenge that bigger ports have is they also have so many more stakeholders. It's really kind of driving that stakeholder alignment that can slow so many things down. And so I think small ports, small terminals, um, they have a... a quite a large advantage in terms of just a smaller number of stakeholders to bring the table to agree to change. And I think that by itself can accelerate so much. And typically, you know, what we see in terms of slowing down projects, even where everybody sees the value, everyone's agreed on the value, it's getting various stakeholders to the table to all agree on how to move forward. That's often the biggest challenge. You know, we hear, I think a lot of port areas, port authorities, they want to implement um, single window systems. You know, and that's kind of similar to what you mentioned, this kind of, you know, single system that everyone's on, everyone's seeing the same source of data and the same truth. Well, it's actually easier to drive that in a smaller port area, a smaller port authority, because they've just got less stakeholders that they need to align. And so they're able to just push out that change, push out those new systems and adopt them much faster. So thinking about thinking about these local uh, experiments in new infrastructure, et cetera, uh, it makes me think about how ports interact with spe- special economic zones specifically. And uh, as we know, many uh, many special economic zones are also simultaneously ports because of the uh, spillover effects that you gain from the uh, from the logistical advantage of something like that. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me more about uh, how it is that uh, special economic zones, particularly the legal advantages that they have, uh, how they interoperate with the with the shipping space. So if I'm uh, if I'm importing uh, something in uh, something into uh, into a port and it's a uh, special economic zone. I pay no tariff on that. So uh, just from the point of view of a shipping company, does that affect my uh, bottom line in any way? Do I prefer working with special economic zones compared to ports uh, that aren't special economic zones? Like, th- does this interact at all with the uh, with the shipping industry? Oh, certainly. Um, you know, and I think we we've seen things like um, you know, Adani uh, with their special economic zone limited, you know, taking on kind of a, a 10-year um debt with it. And they were able to kind of refinance the existing debt, help to diversify their portfolio because of those tax incentives. Uh, and so certainly it comes into play with the payback um, and kind of guarantee and the types of uh, ROI you're looking to achieve because you're just lowering the threshold to make that investment. Of course, that's exactly why economic zones, special economic zones are set up is to kind of provide that incentive to drive technology and drive change and to lower that threshold of ROI for people to want to invest in technology and modernizing uh, the industry. So with regard to investing in the shipping and logistics space, it seems like something that pays dividends entirely too late. It's not like, you know, software as a service or uh, other sectors that uh, that promise returns way early. It just, it just seems that if you invest in, you know, a container ship. So uh, I know that Samsung Heavy Industries, uh, one of their uh, floating production uh, storage and uh, offloading vessels costs something in the range of $12 billion. Um, when you buy something like that as a company, it takes probably, you know, if it's a $12 billion investment, probably as many years for that investment to pay for itself. So I'm wondering, what is it that drives investment into these um, into these developments in the logistics space? Because the returns are... Uh, I don't want to say anemic, but uh, they're very, very slow to come in. How is it that they keep attracting this high level of investment? Yeah, and I think I think it's somehow uh, similar to when you're investing in real estate in an area where you know, hey, that's just going to expand, that's just going to grow. Um, you have certain trends. You can look at things like population growth, where you're going to expect 
there will be growth, there will be more consumption, there will be more goods traded between certain areas. And typically with port investments and concessions, you know, around the world, terminals typically get uh, 10 to 40 year concessions. So that's kind of the time frame that these government entities who are leasing land are looking at. And really, they're doing their financials and their growth plans on these kind of 10 plus year scales. Um, I think the, the ships were sort of interesting that you mentioned, and, that, and it kind of made me think about um you know, we, we always see this kind of mismatch between um, supply and demand when it comes to, to container ships in general. And, and part of that's the lag time to build the ships. It takes about four years. And so there's always this kind of four-year mismatch um, just because orders get put in. And then when they're really available, you know, four years later, the, the situation may have changed. Um, when you look at how these terminals um, and ports and carriers do their agreements. We saw a lot of longer term service level agreements get formed. And a lot of that coming out of the 2020 uh, COVID pandemic and, and sort of with the bounce back of the economy and the world economy, um, we saw lots of players in the supply chain looking at these longer term agreements. And I think part of that is to bring that level of security and stability to their financial revenue and return so that they were also living in kind of less chaotic economic times. Um, and that, that was a change, I think, into, to previously where there are a bit more short-term contracts. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of value uh, crossing these oceans and uh, you know, capturing even a small, uh, a small percentage of it is extremely difficult just with the time horizons that you're uh, dealing with, you know, a ship taking four years to construct. And you know, these are massive engineering projects and props to anybody who's, uh, who's active in that space. I'm pretty sure that uh, it's practically impossible to do it in less than four years. But uh, particularly what I'm, uh, what I'm thinking of just as a result of the you know, time preference and all that that we just mentioned is uh, how the overseas shipping industry uh, makes certain distances seem uh, completely completely out of whack with uh, what we would uh, expect otherwise. So this is a statistic that, I, that I'll keep repeating till I'm, uh, till I'm hoarse. Uh, sending a shipping container via ship from Shanghai to Mombasa costs uh, $500. Then moving that same shipping container from uh, Mombasa to Kigali uh, via road costs another three thousand. Even though from one point to no to another, uh, you're, uh, you're you're essentially sending it ninety five percent of the way down on uh, via container ship, and then five percent of it is uh, is via road, and you know over seventy percent of the cost is uh, is in that five percent of road. So I'm thinking how uh, how shipping makes the world way more connected. So you know the city of Adelaide in uh, in Australia in many ways is closer to uh, is closer to Cape Town uh, in South Africa than it is to somewhere uh, in the north, of, uh, somewhere in the northern regions of uh, of Australia, somewhere inland where uh, where you're supposed to road it in, right? So, uh, what what do you think are the regions that are currently the most busy as far as uh, as far as shipping uh, shipping goes? Obviously, there's choke points like the Panama Canal and Suez and uh, Malacca Strait, but uh, are there any emerging new routes for uh, for shipping? I'm primarily thinking about, let's say, the new the newly discovered Arctic route uh, between China and Europe. Are there any other new routes that are uh, that are opening up and beginning to make sense? Yeah, I think one of the, the interesting things that we saw with the COVID pandemic, and I, I mentioned these carriers all kind of having more more blank sailings, reducing the routes uh, to heavily cut back on their costs, is we saw a huge surge in freight rail. And so especially here in Europe, we saw a lot more rail going through kind of the middle corridor. And um, I think rail volumes have been kind of doubling through so from uh, China to Europe and, of course, through Poland, uh, through Hungary. Uh, through Turkey, and then to the rest of Western Europe. And so this kind of middle quarter, I think we've been talking about it quite a bit, or at least, uh, you know, in the industry, but really with uh, COVID and this change in uh, ships and the um, uncertainty with vessel schedules, I think this pushed a lot of freight to go in rail. And so we saw a lot of new services opening up in the last year uh, throughout Europe, handling this freight rail from China to Western Europe and, and having new services in seven days or less, um, you know, east to west. <laughs> I mean, uh, rail is, uh, is you know, r relatively new compared to, uh, compared to Transoceanic shipping. So I'm thinking about uh, other uh, other models of uh, of transport, and now we're going into something that may be both out of your wheelhouse and mine. Um, but do you think that uh, that orbital transport, uh, spaceports, and uh, and things of that nature, might be something that will slowly become added to the Swiss Army knife of intermodal transport? 
Oh, I think certainly. And, you know, when we look at really high value assets, I think medicines, pharmaceuticals, that's already what we do today. Um, and so shippers have at their disposal, you know, different modalities. Um, and of course, they have different associated costs, but they have different transport times. So they're always making these decisions, you know, is it worth shipping those medicines or should I just do air freight for those medicines? And I think we'll see, of course, the vast increase in uh, cargo air freight, you know, that's also massively increased, especially with things like, you know, Amazon, the Amazon effect of this next door, next day delivery. Uh, a lot of that freight is going via air uh, if it's not being stockpiled at local warehouses. And so I think that will continue. And I think we'll start to see that apply to lower and lower cost assets. Of course, with things like medicines and pharmaceuticals that have to be refrigerated or temperature controlled, it makes a lot of sense. I think we'll start to see that more and more for smaller valued items. Logistics has always been endlessly fascinating to me. Uh, this conversation was uh, was no exception. Uh, Mina, you're uh, welcome back onto the podcast anytime. Uh, if you have any final thoughts, feelings, or uh, questions uh, that you want to close with, I think um, the next five years is going to be quite interesting and. In- and how the logistics industry changes. There's been, I think, so much of a rethink in general, how we work for all of us, how we work. You know, people aren't going into the offices anymore. Um, They're not commuting anymore. We're doing our jobs from kind of anywhere. And I think seeing some of these trends, they really accelerated things like cloud-hosted solutions and more technology. Of course, we're all, we're doing this call on Zoom today. And I think all of us have gotten a bit of Zoom fatigue with the pandemic, but seeing how these trends and the way kind of everybody is working is really going to come and affect uh, the logistics and the shipping sector, I think is going to be truly interesting in the next five years. I think we're going to see a lot more remote management, centralized management, different locations, shifting uh, labor costs, but also shifting expertise, no longer needing to hire people um, super local to a particular area, because now you can kind of hire the best expertise around the world, uh, what makes sense and, and kind of work more and more like um, modern businesses, uh, often do in multinationals. And so I think we'll see lots of terminals, ports, and shipping companies start to adopt more of these kind of labor models. That's that's fascinating to think about. Uh, you know, you mentioned at the start of the podcast, the sort of longshoreman type of, uh, of Marlon Brando on the waterfront, you know, loading up the, uh, the ship just manually. And uh, now when we take a look at, uh, at container shipping, uh, that just seems so uh, antiquated. And I'm wondering what the next thing is that's going to make sh- container shipping look like, uh, like container shipping is making uh, stevedoring look like. Mina, if people want to follow, uh, follow your thoughts or uh, of anybody else at Navis, uh, what are good places to find you guys on the internet? Uh, so LinkedIn, uh, you can get us uh, at Navis LinkedIn uh, on Twitter. And of course, uh, you can always email me directly, uh, mina.shaw at navis.com. And I think Alaska will probably put that on somewhere on the website. Uh, always happy to talk. Always happy to have guests like you on, Mina. You're welcome back onto the podcast anytime. Uh, we'll have all the links that you mentioned in the description, as well as our own regular social media. And another thing will be down in the description. Uh, Adrianople Group is going to be present at the Translogistica Transport and Logistics Exhibition in Warsaw, Poland, from the 3rd to the 5th of November. Uh, if this discussion was interesting to you, we'd love to see you there and potentially continue the conversation live. Uh, this was the Geoeconomics Podcast. I'd like to thank you for your time, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.